is important. It's located presently at the British Museum in England, uh, which a lot of stuff is in the British Museum. For at one time, they ruled a quarter of the earth and over a third of the people of the earth under Victoria. But this Cyrus cylinder matches what the scripture says about Cyrus giving a decree to send the children of Israel back into the Holy Land, give them the right to rebuild their temple, rebuild their walls, and restore their priesthood. So I'll leave it up here if you'd like to see it. It's 2,600 years old. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, hope you have, we'll turn with me in the book of John, chapter number 1, verse 1. John 1.1. 1, 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Lord, bless this holy Word now. It's not my Word. It's your Word, Lord. Bless it. Send it out, Father, for the purpose you intended. It will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please. In thy name I pray, amen. So I want to call your attention to verse number one where it says, The Word was God. So therefore, the Word being God, therefore God is eternal. He's an absolute eternal being from everlasting to everything. Everlasting is God. He had no beginning. Therefore, the Word of God has no beginning because it is God. But you notice that the Word of God came and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Word of Almighty God. But I want to call your attention to Luke chapter 24, verse 25, when it said, Then He said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses... And all the prophets, he expounded to them in the, all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When he says beginning at Moses, he's talking about the first five books of the Bible, commonly referred to as the Pentateuch. Yes. But notice carefully, he expounded unto them in the scriptures yes. the things concerning himself. It must yes. have taken some time to do that. John chapter number 5 and verse 39, he said, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. These proud, arrogant people who thought they were masters of the Bible and said in John chapter number 9, these people are damned because they are ignorant of the scriptures. We are the masters and the keepers of the law. But the Lord Jesus said, search the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 42, Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder." The Lord Jesus Christ is analyzing an analogy and making it known in his time, saying plainly, did you never read the scriptures? Yes. Matthew chapter 26 verse 54 says, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Why this? Because it says in John chapter number 10 and verse number 35, if he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture is like a chain, beginning with all the prophecies, beginning with everything that relates to the word of God. If one link of that chain missed, was broken, or taken away, it would do away with the entire validity, veracity of the scriptures. Therefore, it cannot be broken. 
it will be fulfilled. It is the eternal word of God. And so therefore, when we open the Bible, we open it as Bible believers. Folks, I believe the Bible. <laughs> I believe it. I don't understand all of it, but I believe the word of God. So therefore, when we make reference to the scriptures, we talk first of all about the eternal word. We talk about something that existed before creation, when creation was brought into being. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there's a telescope that was sent up, the, sent up this last December called the James Webb Space Telescope. It's supposed to be able to see better than the Hubble, and it, is, it has. It has proven itself very, very good and effective. It sends back, it sends back photographs now that, that are clear where they weren't before. And it says this. It says that it has shattered the astronomers' preconceptions. In plain words, as they dig deeper into the creation, they realize that a lot of things they took for granted were wrong. Amen. Amen. Mark that down. Don't ever let a scientist, so-called, shake your faith in the word of God. I have nothing against science. I've got a pacemaker right here. I've had five ablations. I take medication every day, and that is a product of science. Thank God for it. I'm not against science. What I am against is this arrogant arrogant, I mean arrogant idea that we are ignorant when we believe the Bible and that they can answer the questions that the Bible does not answer. No, they can't. They figure the age of the universe mostly by the speed of light. Light travels 186,000 miles a second. But now, but now, that has been brought into question. And there are the scientists who say, well, now, you know that it could be a variable thing that it could be traveling at that speed for a while and then change that speed, then lo and behold, if that be true, then all these distances that we've been told that this galaxy and this and that and this and that are from us may not be what they have said. And therefore the billions of years that they ascribe to the age of the universe may be preconceptions. <laughs> that are totally and absolutely wrong. So what matters, preacher? I'm going to tell you what matters. The one that made it, that's what matters. For I marvel when I look off into these, Now I've looked at some of the photographs, I intend to look at more of them. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. The creation of God is a magnificent thing. When I look out and see that, I find nothing wrong with that. It was made by one who is absolute and completely and absolutely above us and beyond our mind. He spoke it into existence. Almighty God he is. And I worship him. I love him. I praise him. He's my God today and forever. Amen. No problem with me whatsoever. But I'm going to tell you this, folks, regardless of how beautiful the universe is and the creation, it can do nothing for the sin problem. It can do nothing for the hurt issue. Some of you are hurting today. Some of you are in sorrow. It can do nothing for the survival issue. There are those right now scratching and clawing, tearing down to whatever they can to survive. The beauty of the universe will not affect that. And then the death issue, pointed to men wants to die, and then the judgment, and then the judgment. But the Lord Jesus Christ did something about the death issue that the creation, the beauty of it could not do. When he rose from the dead, he said, because I live, John, ye shall live also. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I've got the keys of death and hell in my hand. In the Psalm, chapter number 19, one of the most beautiful Psalms in the Old Testament, referring back to the eternal word. It talks about the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Speech, it talks about night after night, other speech and you get up and you look at that and you realize there's got to be some kind of a message coming from that because that was there before the word was ever written down. It also in Romans chapter number 10 verse 18 the apostle Paul quotes Psalm 19 
where it talks about a bride come bridegroom coming out of his chamber in the tabernacle that holds the sun. He quotes that in the book of Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 18. And he uses that as a direct reference to the salvation of a sinner. Yeah. The heavens yeah. declare the glory of God. What's the glory of God? First of all, it's his power. He brings into existence, baraz, the Hebrew word, to bring into, exist into existence from nothing. Where did it come from? It came from the power of his word. Yeah. All he has to do is speak it and it's done. The glory of God has to do with his beauty. It's called the beauty of holiness. He is beautiful. All beauty one day will be measured by the beauty of Almighty God. The glory of God has to do with His wisdom. There's a purpose in all of this, folks. There's a reason for you living now. There's a reason for this planet to be in existence. And then finally, the glory of God manifests His greatness. Greatness. Larger than this universe. And it's big, they say, but He's bigger than it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, yes. Amen. He's mighty. He's Amen. all Almighty, Almighty God. And so therefore it is His greatness. And these are only four things that have to do with the glory of God. The Bible said that Moses looked into the face of the glory of God. His face began to shine. And my friend, when he turned around and he looked at the children of Israel, he had to cover it because it was moving off. But I'm going to tell you something right now. One day you will look into the face of the glory of God and it will never dissipate forever and ever and ever. We shall bear the image of the heavenly as we've borne the image of the earthly. You live in a body of clay, a tabernacle of dirt, which goes back to the dirt, but he made you for a purpose, and that is to enjoy God. Amen. 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 So there's the eternal word, then there's the written word. And we've got the written word right here before us, 66 books of, of Holy Scripture. Now, folks, there's an awful lot of books out there, pseudepigraphic writings, apocryphal writings, all kinds of stuff out there claiming to be the word of God, Gnostic gospels, this, that, this, that. But there are 66 inspired books that make up that canon of Scripture, and that's all that I accept is the word of God. It is the written word of God. Aren't you glad you can pick up a book and say, I've got everything God said in this book right here. He wants me to have the written word of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ was here, he quoted the written word of God. And he quoted it more than most people begin to understand. He quoted about the creation of Adam and Eve. The Lord Jesus did. He quoted the murder of Abel. He quoted that. He quoted the Noah and his time about how, 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 how what a terrible, vicious time the time of Noah was. He quoted Lot's day when he said, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming son of man. He quoted the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord Jesus quoted that. He also quoted Moses in this burning bush and the manna that came down from heaven. And then he quoted Moses and the brazen serpent. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He must have spent some time in the Bible. When he was 12 years old, he confounded the doctors of the law because of his knowledge of the Bible. Can you imagine uh, being there that day and just listening to what he had to say when he spoke to one of the doctors and said, the scripture says this. What do you think about that? <laughs> oh, yes. Time he was 12 years old. He quoted Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. He quoted David and that showbread. He quoted Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. He quoted Naaman the leper. He quoted the murder of Zechariah. And he quoted Daniel and the abomination of desolation. They don't like that. Scholars and the reprobates, they hate the idea that somebody could quote the Bible and make an application of Daniel. He called him a prophet. Why don't you know, Lord, that Daniel wasn't written until about three or 400 B.C.? It was written after all the events that record. No, I believe Christ. And I believe that he knew that Daniel was a prophet. And that was written about 500, 600 B.C., yeah. along in that time span there. Oh, yes. He quoted Daniel and the abomination. He quoted Jonah and the whale. Amen. Yeah. You say, it's a great fish, preacher. It was a fish prepared of God. Yeah. It probably had the biggest mouth than any whale that ever lived, for it swallowed Jonah. Yeah. And as the old timer said one time before, if the Bible said Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd, be, I'd believe that too, and I would. Amen. Yeah. Because I've seen some people with some pretty big mouths. <laughs> Daniel, the abomination of desolation. Jonah and the whale. And then Jonah and the Ninevites. 
So what does that mean, preacher? That means the Lord Jesus Christ had an absolute profound knowledge of the Word of God. That meant that as he walked among men, he was the living Word, quoting the written Word. That meant that his life was motivated, his life was, his life was controlled completely by thus saith the Lord. As absolutely as I read to you just a few minutes ago, how then can the Scripture be fulfilled? I must do what must be done. And so it was when he bowed his head at Calvary and said, Father, it's finished. He not only finished the work he came to do and finished the work to be our supreme sacrifice and Savior at the right hand of the Father, but he finished the declaration of the Word of God of the Redeemer dying on the cross. It was finished and it cannot be changed. And he preached about Jonah and the Ninevites on the road to Emmaus when the two met him after the resurrection. They were probably, I guess like most people, they had a general understanding, a kind of a skimming knowledge of the word of God. But they had never really gotten into it, what it said. And then he opened the scriptures to them. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us, within us when he opened to us the Bible? Folks, let me tell you something. Most of what you hear today are just skimming the surface. Most of what you hear in most churches, they have a list of do's and don'ts. They've got their doctrine, and that's all you're going to get. You're going to get, the, you're going to get their propaganda. I don't care what. That's what you're going to get. But open the Bible and get on your knees and begin to read it, and you'll be amazed at the truth that in, that's in the Scripture. The Scripture is the Word of God. There's the living Word. Now think about this. When the Lord Jesus Christ walked among them, they were looking at that eternal Word. They were looking at the spoken word of God. Yes. They were looking at the living word of God. Yes. They were looking at one that had the power to walk on water, raise the dead, yes. cast the leper out. They were watching, looking, observing. And John says, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of yes. grace and truth. We beheld him in his life. Yes. And Peter said, I speak not as others. He said, I was there. I saw him. I was witness. I was there on top of the mountain. I touched him. Yes. I know what I'm talking about, oh, Peter yes. said. Yes. And I believe, Peter, believe me, I do. Yes. And so the living word had power over creation. He said, be still to the waters. They couldn't understand him. Water can't under, water has no intelligence. It's not a being that, a sentient being that can respond to something that's said to it. But the power of the word of God puts life forth. Yeah. Just like when he spoke to my soul in 1973. There was really nothing in there that could answer or respond. He put something in there that could answer and respond. Are you what? Well, that's a powerful thing I just said. That's strong. That's real strong. For I have not, I didn't have the ability to see what I was any more than anybody else did until the light came. And when the light came, boy, did I ever listen. I didn't reject it. I believed it. I received it. I re accepted it. And that's what brought conviction. It'll do it for you this morning. Do you want the truth? Do you want the word of God? We're not interested in making a Baptist out of you. I'm not one bit concerned about you being a Baptist. A Southern Baptist, Independent Baptist, Free Will Baptist, this Baptist, that. No. My concern for you today is that you know Amen. the Word of God. Amen. He had power over the spirit world. He said to the devil, get thee hence. And folks, I tell you right now, the more I study the Bible, the more I believe that Satan had a personal vindictiveness for the Lord Jesus Christ. He hated him because he knew who he was. He was his counterpart. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. The Lord Jesus Christ is the anointed of God. Both of them are Mashiachs. Mashiach in Hebrew is Messiah. But the Lord Jesus Christ was God's Messiah. And the world has its own. It listens to its own. It believes in its own. It trusts its own. Why do people hate the Lord Jesus Christ? I love him, don't you? I have every reason to love him today. Why well, hate him? I can understand how you pick me to death and you could hate me, no problem. I understand that. Oh, no, I listen, no problem. But him to hate the Son of God, that is mind boggling. He had power over sin. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. There's something in the Bible that keeps eating me away, and I've been studying about it, been praying over it, and it just hasn't come to me yet. And I want to give it out to you this morning, let you take it home and meditate on it this afternoon. What is the essence of sin? What is it? 
You say it's to miss the mark. No, that's the action of sin, not the essence of it. It comes in different forms, manifests itself in different ways. But what is the essence of sin? Well, let me tell you this. The essence of sin started with that anointed cherub that covereth. It started with Satan. It started the one that was in Ezekiel 28, that high and lofty and lifted up position. If we ever find the essence of sin, we can go to the root of our problem. Amen. Most people, they spend all their time chopping and, and brooming and grooming the top but they never go to the root. Amen. Most preaching is just putting band-aids on your problem, but they never go to the root. What is the root? You say, preacher, I wanna feel, feel the Holy Ghost. Get on your knees, read the Bible, do some praying. You'll feel the Holy Spirit, amen. Preacher, I want a revival. Good, God bless your soul. I'll guarantee you, you can have revival. Amen. You can have revival. Say, my church doesn't, I don't care about your church. You can have revival. What if we had about 150 youths in here that wanted to have revival? Are you following me? Then we'd have a church-wide revival. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? When you, yes, wouldn't it? He had power over sin. He said to him, thy sins are forgiven. To a woman that washed his feet with her hair because he cried the tears of repentance and joy. There's something about a tear of repentance and joy that's the same thing. Isn't that something? Same tear. It's got repentance and joy in it. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Think about that. Repentance and joy in the same tear. She had enough of them to let them fall on his feet. Then she took her glory, her hair's her glory. That's a woman's glory. And she took her glory and she washed his feet with her glory. In plain words, she said, I got no glory. You're my glory. You're the Lord. He said, thy sins be forgiven. Boy, did it ever make him mad? But does he have power to forgive sins? Have you ever had your sins forgiven? Have you ever felt that burden lift up on your soul? Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever gotten into a closet weighed down? You know that you've done something. It's eating you alive. You've tried everything, and yet nothing helps except what he did for you at the cross. And say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I don't know why. I don't have to know why. But I believe your blood can wash my sins away. Wash them away, Lord Jesus. Cleanse me. If you do that, so you may want to do it here. You may want to come down here this morning. You may want to come down here and pray that prayer. Pray that prayer. Talk to him. And your sins will be forgiven. And there's no greater feeling on this earth than that lightness, that, that lightness, that, that joy, that, that lifting, that lifting of that burden. You can't, you can't fake that. You either, if you're, are you faking yourself? Are you deceiving yourself? Or have you ever been forgiven? You're watching me? Are you listening? If you never have, then you're just part of the show. But if you have, you know what it is to pray and have it lifted and know that your sins are forgiven. That's the most wonderful thing in the world. He had power over death. He did. The living word of God could speak to death. To death. And say, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Every time he saves a soul, he says, come forth. And you that were dead in trespasses and sins, come forth. We have dead people come in here and they leave alive. <laughs> Amen. They come in dead and they leave alive. I wish you'd give him a try. Oh, how I do. I, I do, I do, I do. Oh, how I do. Because I know what he can do for you. Oh, I know what he can do for you. Oh, Lord have mercy. Do I ever know what he can do for you? He had power over the cross. What do you mean, preacher? He died on the cross. Yeah, but he changed the meaning of it. So what do you mean? Well, he took an instrument of death and it became an instrument of life. I, Paul said, I will glory in the cross. When you look at that cross, you look at life because life, this is at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ to whom the world is crucified unto me. And then he took a curse and turned it into a blessing. Yes, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. And then he took hate and changed it to love. Nobody ever loved me, preacher. I'll take you to the cross. 
Don't ever let, don't ever let a Calvinist tell you that he didn't die for you. That's pure garbage. By the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. Don't ever let them tell you that he didn't die for you. He died for all mankind, every last one of us. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, is the atonement. The atonement for all, every one of us. And that means you. That means me. And that's what this is about, the living word. Now, what do you mean, preacher? I mean that this book right here is alive. Yes, it is. Right. <laughs> it's alive. Yes, it's, it knows more than I do. I read it, but it's reading me. Yes. How many's ever had that feeling? Yes. You read it, took it in, and blessed it, and God blessed you with it, and it's a wonderful thing, and hallelujah to God. But then you get to thinking, good night, there's something going on inside me. Yeah, because it's reading you. It searches the heart. It tries the reins. The Word does. Well, then that means that it's a living thing. Yes, it is. The Word of God is quick. The word quick means alive. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You take that book and you say, Lord, I believe the Bible's the Word of God. Good. Step one. Yeah. I believe it's the Word of God. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lord, I believe that uh, I'm in there somewhere. Good. Step two. Yeah. Yeah. You're in here. Yes, sure. And you say, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ was real and that he really lived. Yes, good. Step three. You got that right. Yeah. And you say, well, now, you know, I believe he lived and I believe that he went to a cross and he died. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're on the right track. And then he died, bowed his head and said, Father, it's finished. They took him down, laid him in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he arose from the dead. Yes. Got that. Yes. Yes. Well, then what's left, preacher? You believe all that? Reach up and take hold of him. Take hold of him. Take hold of him. And it'll become alive in you now. It'll leave here and it'll go down here. As one smart man said, there's only about 18 inches between temporal and eternal. Father, bless your word. Thank you for the day. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the day that you came to me and changed my life. I want to help somebody. I believe that somebody heard this this morning. I really do. I believe they heard it where they need to hear it, in their spirit. Father, I pray for them. I pray for them. Heavenly Father, glorify yourself now. And I call them by the grace of God, in thy holy name. Amen. Let's stand up and sing, brother. What do we got here?